Hello, and welcome to our program. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, Professor of Pathology at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which is a joint venture between the Digital Pathology Association and Path Presenter. Um, our aim and goal is to help you in your practice of pathology to uh, understand and see more examples and uh, classic examples of uh, interesting case material that we encounter and also to help you to understand some of the clinical questions that surround uh, these cases as they come to our attention. Uh, our case today is a somewhat unusual patient, a 14-year-old boy who was found to have a tumor in a pancreatic tail. Now, this is not a very common and commonly encountered uh, situation, as uh, certainly uh, tumors in general in children are relatively uncommon, and in the pancreas, perhaps even more so. Uh, but there are still a number of recognized entities that can occur in this uh, scenario, the most frequent of which actually is pancreatical blastoma, uh, a tumor exclusively of childhood uh, that, as it says, uh, has a somewhat immature appearance. But we can also see neuroendocrine tumors at this age group. Solid pseudopapillary tumors can occur in a pediatric or adolescent age group, as well as the more middle-aged typical uh, scenario. And then many of the cystic lesions uh, mucinous cystic uh, neoplasm, IPMN, rarely carcinomas of acinar, and even less frequently of ductal type could occur uh, in a pediatric age group. Now, of note, there are a number of other tumors like Ewing sarcoma, or sometimes called peripheral neuroectodermal tumor, that can occur in the pancreas. It's an unusual site, but which are certainly more, more frequent in this age group. And then uh, caposiform hemangioendothelioma, so-called blue bleb disease, uh, and inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor recently has been described. It's important to recognize, however, that several of these uh, lesions have some association with certain syndromes, such as beckman wiedemann syndrome, multiple endocrine neoplasia, von Hippel-Lindau, neurofibromatosis, tuberous sclerosis, these sorts of things that are frequently encountered in, in children. And of course, don't forget cystic fibrosis, uh, can occasionally have an association with some of these neoplasms. So I won't go into the details of the specifics with regard to these uh, various syndromes, but recognize that if you have a patient who has some sort of syndromic uh, presentation, uh, that, that the lesion in the pancreas may be readily uh, subclassified almost based on that particular uh, entity. And contrary-wise, if you have a pancreatic tumor, it would be good sometimes to question whether or not there is a syndrome uh, going on in the backdrop as well. So with the history this patient had, uh, he came to endoscopy and our interventional endoscopist uh, did some nice uh, needle core biopsies uh, via the <clears throat> transgastric uh, or trans uh, uh, small bowel root. And as you can see, we got a lot of blood along with that, but uh, we have uh, a mixture of tissues here. So we can see here, for example, uh, it looks like we have some nice acinar uh, epithelium. It's sort of lobulated, got the granular cytoplasm that we associate with pancreatic acini um, and looks uh, fairly unremarkable. So uh, that's uh, one feature, but then as we look here, you can see we have these little islands of uh, cells sort of popping up here with a, a somewhat prominent central uh, small capillary type vessel, uh, and then these uh, radiating cells around that vessel, uh, almost in a uh, rosette type fashion, uh, radi out, radiating out from that uh, uh, architecture. We don't see necrosis. We don't see high grade uh, nuclei or uh, mitotic activity. Um, this is a relatively uh, uniform lesion, but you can see it's, it's fairly similar uh, in size, nuclei, and so forth to the acinar epithelium, as you can see here. So this would, of course, raise the differential as to what should we be thinking. Well, uh, most of us don't see uh, pancreatic oblastomas very frequently, so what would we expect with that lesion? Um, that's a lesion which typically does have rosettes. Uh, it does have fairly uh, large nuclei with uh, prominent uh, uh, nucleoli um, and can grow in sort of a sheet-like fashion with occasional intervening areas. Uh, this one occurring in the head of the pancreas, 
uh, somewhat more frequently than elsewhere, uh, but uh, not impossibly in the tail of the pancreas. When we think about um, <clears throat> uh, Ewing sarcoma uh, or PMET, uh, again, this is more frequent in the head of the pancreas, and you can see it uh, here in the radiographs uh, and the appearance here. And it doesn't have this sort of uh, um, island-like architecture that we saw, but will be nicely CD99 positive, as you can see here, and be composed of uh, fairly uh, uh, cellular, uh, uh, smaller cells uh, with uh, modest amounts of cytoplasm. So uh, a consideration, uh, but probably not the sort of thing that we're going to encounter uh, today. And then finally, just to touch on inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, which is relatively uncommon. Again, this is uh, probably a tumor to be encountered in the head of the pancreas, as you can see here, um, somewhat obstructing the duct, um, and uh, might be confused because of that uh, nature with autoimmune pancreatitis, which usually a little bit older population, but certainly can also present as an obstructive mass uh, radiographically and uh, clinically. So in our situation, we went ahead to do some uh, uh, markers. And as you can imagine, uh, the immunohistochemistry is going to tell us the story. So here's the first one that we did. Um, and as you can see, this is nicely staining our tumor cells here, around here, but totally negative uh, in the uh, uh, acinar uh, component. This is CD10, uh, which, uh, albeit a nonspecific marker, uh, is helpful in the differential here because it stains relatively few other things within the pancreas. So that probably takes us out of the neuroendocrine markers, but lest we be uh, conf uh, concerned about that, here's the chromogranin, which you, as you can see, has only a few positive uh, islets uh, uh, remaining, but not any positivity in our tumor. And uh, here, a pancytokeratin, uh, again, showing that our lesion uh, pretty well lacks any uh, evidence of cytokeratin uh, within the cytoplasm of these cells compared to the acinar uh, parenchyma. And uh, synaptophysin uh, here, uh, actually showing a fair degree of positivity. Uh, so this is somewhat helpful, but also uh, is one of the caveats with this particular neoplasm that uh, if we don't include uh, solid pseudopapillary tumor in the differential diagnosis and just uh, do a few stains to demonstrate neuroendocrine differentiation, uh, we could trip and uh, stumble on this uh, pitfall uh, because this does have some weak cytoplasmic positivity with uh, synaptophysin. And then uh, finally, here is the uh, here is the uh, confirmatory stain, um, a uh, beta catenin which as you can see, negative in the pancreatic parenchyma, but just lighting up uh, all of this, uh, the tumor uh, around these small vessels, which are negative. And you're seeing here both uh, strong cytoplasmic staining as well as uh, some uh, nuclear staining as well. Uh, so certainly consistent with a CTN uh, and B1 uh, mutated status. So solid pseudopapillary tumor, uh, is an unusual tumor for this uh, in this situation because it's almost exclusively found in young women, but our patient is a young man, and it's certainly at the lower end of uh, frequency of encountering. Uh, it's a mean age of 35, um, so uh, it is unusual in that such circumstance. However, the location is quite typical, body or tail, uh, and of, of note, this is a tumor that has... Uh, in the past uh, decade or two, been found in a number of extrapancreatic sites, including the ovary, uh, retroperitoneum, and so forth. It's a low malignant potential lesion, virtually never metastasizes, and long, as long as it's completely excised, uh, should not recur. Um, it typically has this papillary architecture with a, a somewhat mixoid and occasionally hyaline stalk. Uh, and the cells that line the papillae are rather poorly cohesive. And so it tends to fall apart. And that is where this sort of pseudopapillary appearance uh, is, uh, arises. Um, additionally, it's also prone to 
uh, areas of hemorrhage, uh, degeneration. And so oftentimes you'll have very large areas where you've got cholesterol clefts and necrotic debris and so forth, um, and only a few remaining areas of uh, viable tumor. Uh, we've indicated here some of the other stains that can be positive, uh, E. cadherin, alpha-1 antitrypsin or chymotrypsin, cyclin-D1, CD10, which we saw. Uh, CD99 occasionally can also be positive, as well as CD56, TFE3, and so forth. Um, it tends to be negative with uh, estrogen receptor and chromogranin, although um, no, we've not uh, found that uh, be, to be very important. So uh, needless to say, this uh, patient came to resection. It was a healthy young fellow, and uh, the tumor was excised. And here you can see a very nice cross-section uh, with really very little, if any, degeneration. We do have this uh, one nice, uh, a few nice uh, blood lakes here. Uh, but other than that, you can see that there's a fairly uniform uh, grouping of uh, the tumor. Now, here we see that there's been some prior hemorrhage. And here you see this uh, poor cohesiveness to the tumor, where it sorts of tends to fall apart. Um, and uh, so the, the boundaries between areas served by a particular vessel can be, become quite uh, confusing. Here, there are very few of these small vessels. And it's not clear all the time which uh, uh, of the uh, fronds are, are serviced by that particular vessel. Uh, in more uh, well-preserved and uh, less discohesive areas, uh, you'll see we still get a degree of this sort of cracking um, and fragmentation between uh, islands of the tumor, much as we saw on the biopsy. So uh, when it comes out and fragments into those fronds, it's because the cohesiveness between uh, these cells here on the outer side of these papillae uh, is uh, uh, distinct or different or weaker than uh, would be uh, uh, seen in other more cohesive uh, neoplasms. So I've included in the uh, slide deck here for your further study several other sections from this uh, tumor. I won't belabor the, uh, the uh, description and so forth, but include them here for your study. Uh, as well as an additional uh, slide at the end of the slide deck uh, for comparison from another case, another patient, uh, to also allow you to uh, review these at your at your will. And I'd encourage you to do so because having seen digital slides, having interacted with them, you'll be much more likely to uh, remember the uh, features when it comes time for you to be on the line and say, oh, what kind of tumor is this? So we hope you enjoyed that. This is uh, uh, kind of fun for us to do, and uh, we do uh, hope that it's a benefit to you. Our final diagnosis on today's case, solid pseudopapillary tumor of the pancreas. And uh, as you know, we, we tend to put out uh, new videos every now and then. So uh, subscribing will ensure that you uh, get notice of those uh, to, uh, videos as they come online. And we always welcome your comments, suggestions, questions, uh, or feedback on our uh, videos. Um, in ways that we can improve or other topics that you'd like to see us cover. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me.